Love is dead.
Hello, good morning, and as always, a very warm welcome to you, whether you're joining us here in the building or whether you're watching at home or whatever time it might be that you're, you're watching at home. Um, a especially warm welcome to you this morning. If it's your birthday today, uh, Andrew, happy birthday to you. We won't, we won't sing to you, but, uh, but a very happy birthday. <laughs> and thanks for still coming here, otherwise, yeah, nothing would happen. So, thank you. Um, a slightly different service this morning in, the, in as much as we were playing a few songs beforehand. Some of you were here slightly earlier to, to hear that. Well, that won't be our, our normal pattern of things. But we've done that today because part of our um, COVID secure procedures, along with distance seating and hand gel um, for those that come here and no singing, unfortunately. Um, we also try to keep the services to a, a kind of minimum, really. Um, and we were taken a little by surprise in that the message that we've got this morning is a little longer than our usual messages. So we haven't cut anything from that, but what we've done is we're just going to have one song in a minute, quite a nice loud song, we'll wake everybody up. It's supposed to be about Joshua and shouting and all the walls coming down, so it, it is quite loud, so be aware. Um, but then after that, we've got the, the reading, which Michael has kindly done for us, and then after that, it's, we're just going to play the message through. I'll be back at the end just to say goodbye. Um, but before any of that, let's just begin with a prayer. Father God, we thank you that we are here now in this moment. We thank you that we have an opportunity to be still, to focus on your word to praise your name and to listen to what you have to say for us. We ask that today is a time of refreshment, of challenge and of encouragement for us so that when we leave here we can continue to be a service to you. Amen. So the song today is called Shout.
Joshua chapter 6, verses 2 to 5 and 12 to 17. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them, sound a loud blast on the trumpets. Have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. Joshua got up early the next morning and the priest took up the Ark of the Lord. The seven priests carrying the seven trumpets went forward, marching before the Ark of the Lord and blowing the trumpets. The armed men went ahead of them and the rear guard followed the Ark of the Lord while the trumpets kept sounding. So on the second day, they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. They did this for six days. On the seventh day they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except on that day they circled the city seven times. The seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet's blast, Joshua commanded the army Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city and all that is in is to be devoted to the Lord. Amen. Good morning. I'm sorry that I can't be with you in person today. But the truth is that I'm recovering from eye surgery, which I undertook yesterday. But I hope that this presentation of the gospel is helpful to you today. Today I want to talk to you a little bit about the Valley of Achor. We can read about the Valley of Achor in the book of Joshua. In essence, the story goes something like this. Under Joshua's leadership, the marvelous and wonderful victory over the Battle of Jericho had been won. The heavily fortified city of Jericho had been wonderfully overcome. And for them, the next step up was to take the small town of A. The truth was that this was not a successful expedition. What should have been easy proved to be a rout. Many Jewish lives were lost and the soldiers had to turn tail and run. It was a great shame. It was an astonishing and shameful setback for the Hebrews, and it demanded an inquest. And the inquest took place in the valley of Achor. The word Achor means trouble, and the valley of Achor has since been synonymous with trouble or difficult times. Immediately after that hugely uplifting, amazing victory of Jericho, the Hebrews found themselves in the Valley of Achor. But isn't that so often the case for us? After the happy highs, a deep low comes along. Just a couple of years ago, for instance, New Thought Baptist Church was going very well. But now it finds itself in the Valley of Achor, the Valley of Trouble or the valley of difficulty. The Hebrews were in trouble because of one man's sin. But the church isn't struggling particularly because of one person's sin. The church is struggling because of the difficult circumstances now pressed upon it. A couple of years ago, 
the church lost its much loved pastor. He decided to leave the ministry and that left a big hole in the life of the church. A painful gap that's been difficult to fulfill. On top of that, the COVID-19 lockdowns have severely restricted church gatherings, making it impossible for us to meet as a church we really long to be. Worship and fellowship and ministry and mission have all been adversely affected. Church life has become both a physical and spiritual battleground. Church leaders are working bravely to mitigate against the troubles. But the truth is that our identity as Christians has taken a massive battery. Without question, New Thought Baptist Church along with many other churches across the UK, is journeying through tough times. We're in the Valley of Acor, the Valley of Trouble. I wonder if you've ever passed through the Peak District, Stony Middleton Village. It's an unattractive village, unlike many in the Peak District. Stony Middleton, you see, sits at the bottom of a very deep vale. The sides of the valley are so steep, almost vertical in places, that very little light gets into the properties that nestle there on the very edge of the hill. Valleys aren't always the best place to be. They're often dark and damp and dismal. The Hebrews were in the dark valley of trouble. How depressing for them, for those who regrouped that day in the valley of Achor. But our Bibles paint a wonderful picture of the potential future intended by God for the Hebrew people. 500 years later, the prophet Hosea spoke these wonderful words of hope for them. In my version of the Bible, it's headed, the Lord's mercy on Israel. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. And there I will give her a vineyard and make the valley of Achor a door of hope. What a wonderful picture of hope in this prophecy of Isaiah. Out of dark times, there's a tantalizing promise of hope, flourishing vineyards, a door of hope for God's chosen people. God, you see, doesn't let his children go. His purposes for them will be fulfilled. His plans for you will come to fruition. The good news in the dark valley of trouble is that God holds the key to the door of hope. The dark place, once known as the valley of trouble, can become a doorway, a doorway to hope in new and better times, planned for God, planned by God for the Hebrew people. When we choose to put a uh, hope in God, outrageous things become possible. The impossible can become possible. Paul, in writing in Romans chapter 4, described the wonderful picture of hope in Abraham's life. A hope so big it was outrageous. Let me read this to you. In hope, Abraham believed against hope that he would become the father of many nations. As he'd been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. 
but he grew strong in faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Abraham, trusting and opening God, really did discover that the impossible becomes possible. So here's the big question for you to reflect on today at New Thought Baptist Church. Have you got big, outrageous hopes for your fellowship? This COVID-19 crisis could actually be an opportunity not just to blindly soldier on, but an opportunity to reflect upon the sort of church God wants you to be when finally we emerge from lockdown rule. I'm just on the outside edge of your fellowship, but I would have a hope for you that you grow together in the love of God and uh, the knowledge of God as you go through this time. My hope is that you might become a powerful light for the people of New Thought. What are your hopes, I wonder, for New Thought Baptist Church? What's your vision for the future? See, without vision, we go off all kinds of tangents. We need vision to move us forward. For the moment, though, we are in the Valley of Trouble. How do we get out of the dark valley? Do we just sit around and wait for God to waft us upward into the sunlit uplands? What should we do? Well, Joshua fell flat on his knees. Well, flat on his face, it says in the scripture. He was face down before God. When we're struggling, when we're in trouble, we should follow Joshua's example, get on our knees and plead with God. Insistent and persistent prayer is the first base when we're struggling. The Lord will hear, in his time, the Lord will answer. God answered Joshua and said, get up, consecrate the people. And emergently, Hebrews were in trouble because of one man's sin, Achan's sin. He disobeyed God and took plunder from Jericho, which he shouldn't have done. I said it already, I said again, uh, that the church at Newthorpe isn't in difficulty because of one man's sin. But sin does haunt each one of us. If we do move forward together as the people of God, we need to help each other walk out of the valley of trouble, then we need to make sure that we are sin-free. Or as Psalm 24 puts it, people with clean hands and a pure heart. You and I are called to be a holy people. And holiness demands a full commitment to the Lord. As baptized Christian believers, we're meant to live as consecrated people. What's consecration about? Well, consecration is the separation of, of things or places from the normal secular world. So we have buildings like churches and chapels consecrated for worship. But people are consecrated as well. And you don't have to be the bloke in the dark colour, the bloke standing at the front of the church uh, to be consecrated. You just have to be a man or a woman who recognises that they are set apart for God, set apart for Christ. In reality, that should be every Christian man and woman because the Holy Spirit wants to come within us, make his home with us. And the wonderful thing is that when the Holy Spirit is within us, the old and the young, the fat and the thin, the beautiful and the ugly, can all become wonderful tools of love in 
the hands of God. I remember many years ago in a church hundreds of miles away, a man who wasn't very eloquent. He wouldn't read his Bible aloud in church. He'd struggle to meet people on the door. But every Sunday morning, hail, rain, wind or snow, that man rose early, walked to the little church minibus and drove it around the town, bringing the frail and the elderly in to worship. He was a consecrated man. In the dark valley, we need to remind ourselves that we are consecrated people. We need to make sure that we are living in holiness. We need to offer all that we have in service to God. What will you do? What will you offer to help the church in these uh, different times? As the church works its way out of the valley of trouble, how are you helping? You see, Christians aren't meant to be the Sunday pew sitters, are we? Christians are men and women who have been repurposed for living holy lives for Christ. We have to live the paradox. On the one hand, we're called out of the world, yet on the other, we're called to live in it as people dedicated to Christ. The Apostle Peter puts it like this. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you might proclaim the excellences of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. You and I are called out of the darkness into the marvellous light of Christ. The light of Christ is our hope, especially in dark times. If we're to walk out of the valley of difficulty, we need to make first sure that each one of us owns our personal responsibility to live as consecrated men and women of God. Let's be a people who walk a consecrated walk. Let's put on consecrated shoes. And that's the first job of any outing, isn't it? To make sure we've got the right footwear, especially if we go walking in the hills. When I'm away on holiday, walking, if I go out in the hills, I will always take a stick. A stick can help me keep my balance. A stick can help me go up hills. A stick can help me ease my way down the slopes. A stick can help me stop falling flat on my face in the mud. And when I'm tired, a stick gives me something to lean upon. And farmers and shepherds have known this for years, haven't they? They know how to make good use of the staff. Christians in the Valley of Trouble also need a staff. We need to learn how to lean on the staff of God. So, pick up your Bibles and learn with me how to lean on the staff of God. You might want to note these things down. Perhaps underline them in the verses in your Bible. I'm going to use my old RSV. It's got lots of underlinings in it. It's become the staff on which I lean. Turn with me first to Psalm 23, verse 4. 23, 4. Even though I walk through the valley for the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The promise is that in the darkest of shadows, the Lord is with us. Evil might surround us in the valley, 
But the presence of God throughout our hard journey is the staff upon which you and I can lean. The shepherd uses his staff to keep the enemies at bay, and sometimes he uses his staff with a firm but gentle hand to keep his sheep on the right pathway. And occasionally we need that, don't we, from God. The ever-present God maintains constant vigilance over his flock, especially as they get journey through the valley of problems and difficulty. The Lord is our comfort. We can be assured today that his intention is to lead you and I to a better place. Turn over the pages to chapter 30 of the Psalms. Psalm 30, verses 4 to 5. Sing praises to the Lord, you his saints. Give thanks to his holy name, for his anger is but for a moment, and his favour is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. There's a lot to be said for singing, to lift the spirits. Coal miners of Wales have joined choirs for years to escape the labour and darkness of the pits. Gospel singing arose in the plantation fields. We know from scripture that Paul and Silas sang whilst in prison. But Christians don't just sing in blind faith. We can sing because we know that our sorrow is short-lived. God's favour over us is for life. In fact, his favour is eternal. As the RSV puts it in verse 5, his anger is but for a moment, his favour for a lifetime. And weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Joy comes with the morning sun. We so often find that our worries of the night, our fears of the night, often disappear in the light of the dawn. That's not to diminish grief that many are going through. Deep grief can't be whitewashed away. Many of us are experiencing grief at the loss of a loved one. You might know someone who's been lost to COVID-19, as I do. But we also encounter grief when the events of life hit each one of us hard. At this time of COVID-19 and so much shutdown, so much of normal life is lost. And many folks are grieving over lost opportunities, lost jobs, lost certainty, and nothing seems certain anymore. It's as if the sure ground beneath our feet has begun to crumble. We mourn the loss of normal life. And experiencing grief is like falling into an emotional spin drive that's been set to the fastest cycle. These emotions are beyond our control. But I know from personal experience, the terrible spin cycle does end one day. With God's help, we really can adjust to new circumstances, a new reality. And one morning, we will know the possibility of knowing joy again. So God promises comfort in trouble. And we recognize that trouble and sorrow is short-lived. I want you to look at another help, help number three, which we find in the book of Isaiah chapter 28, verses 16 to 17. Behold, I am laying in Zion a foundation, a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone 
of a sure foundation. He who believes will not be in haste, and I will make justice the line and righteousness the plummet. This is a prophetic reference to Christ as the stone of protection, the stone of judgment and deliverance to those people who will believe. I draw your attention to it now as the church journeys through the valley of trouble. The stone comforts us because it helps us gain a longer term perspective, a different perspective. Notice how it says the believer is not to be in haste. I once when I recall those occasions when driven by fear, I've acted in haste, usually with poor results. When we act in haste, we often become careless. And in our rush, we leave God out of the equation. In our rush, we don't leave space for God to work. And we fail to remember that his time frame isn't our time frame. So lesson number three is don't panic. God's purposes will be fulfilled. Lesson number four is from a very well-known but often misused verse of scripture from the book of Jeremiah. Chapter 29, verse 10. Thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I'll visit you. I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. Then you call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me, but when you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you, says the Lord. I'll restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations. In many versions, the NIV in particular, talks here about prospering people. And too often we think it's meant to bring a material blessing, a, a blessing perhaps of money or wealth. And I think the RSV is more accurate here you know, in talking about the people's welfare rather than prosperity. The passage is actually talking about a pure and holy God who's lovingly attempting to reconcile the people to himself to bring back a sinful and rebellious people into a real and deep relationship with them. And instead of bringing calamity, God's promise is for their welfare as the people who are set apart from him, the people he wants to see as their consecrated people. The Hebrews were in exile because of God's judgment upon them. The exile was part of God's plan to restore Judah and give them a hope and a future. The judgment promised that if they returned wholeheartedly to God, they would find God again. They would be restored to their promises. And the overarching purpose of that exile was to draw Israel back into relationship with God. God wants his people to prosper. He wants his people in your church to prosper. So the promise in verse 11 for New Thought Baptist Church is that God wants you to prosper as his people, to go forward and grow and flourish as his people. In this valley of trouble and problems and difficulties, the Lord longs for you to turn to him wholeheartedly, to earnestly seek his face so that you might experience his joy despite the different times. And then you might become a people who will carry his hope 
into a hopeless world. No matter how you feel today about church, about the future, know this. The Lord intends good for you as the people of God. Let's look at the psalm again. Psalm 112, verses 6 to 7. For the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. He's not afraid of evil tidings. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. The world around us seems to thrive on evil tidings. Bad news is the lifeblood of the WhatsApps and Twitter forums. And it's the lifeblood of the rolling TV news programs. Watching TV news is bad for your mental health. And I stopped watching TV news last March. Instead, I selectively read the news on my iPad and I read researched news magazines. I've just received my first dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine. That's good news. But now the bad news. The bad news is that there are doubts that it might not be effective over every strain of COVID-19. Well, that shouldn't be a surprise, should it? In life, there's no such thing as 100% safety or 100% certainty. We must learn to live with that. We've got to learn with the tension of, of living with uncertainties. But in tough times, we need to learn who to lean on, who to trust. The scripture reminds us that we have a firm trust in the Lord where we can be unafraid of bad news. I can safely predict that as sure as the sun rises tomorrow, the TV news and the morning newspapers will be full of bad news. But Christians aren't afraid of bad news. Christians need to be afraid of the future because we know the one who owns the future. And as we lean on the staff of God, we find ourselves able to navigate the pathway out of the valley of trouble and the times of difficulty. Is it meant to be like this leaning on the staff of God, this trusting in God? Well, look at a final piece of scripture with me, would you? In Isaiah uh, chapter 30, verse 15. For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest, you shall be saved. In quietness and in trust shall be your strength. Trusting God means we will be saved. We will be secure in him. We will know his shalom, his peace. A friend of mine died recently when COVID-19 finally overtook him. But he had a deep and quiet peace about his situation. He had a quiet trust, even as he was diagnosed with leukemia. Our strength in the valley of trouble is to be found in our quiet trust in the Lord. In this pandemic, lots of people reckon they know their way out and make a big noise about it. But as we journey through the valley of trouble, with all the clamour, and all the worldly noise resounding in our ears, we choose to walk quietly, listening, listening, listening for the voice of God saying, this is the way, walk in it. Dear friends in New Thought Baptist Church, I want you to know you're not alone in these days. The Lord is with you. We must first recognize that we are in difficulty. We must recognize that we need to be on our knees before God. We need to make sure that we are walking consecrated lives. 
and we learn to lean on the staff of God together. Let me pray for you as we close. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Loving Lord, thank you that you understand our situations. Each one of us dealing with this COVID crisis in different ways needs a deeper relationship with you. We thank you for one another as we gather at your church over Zoom, in the room even now, but we seek your blessing out. So would you be the one to lead us out of this valley of difficulty at this time? And then, Lord, we can be a people full of hope. We know what it is to live in you. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Amen. So just a very quick um, goodbye. If you find yourself in that valley, whether you see yourself looking at the, uh, the, the, the light through the end as a, the door of hope, or if you still feel that you're shouting at walls, um, please know that God is with you and we are with you. Do send us a message if there's anything that we can do to help. But for now, goodbye.